Hey y'all, Oki Storm Chaser here, and this is Cooking with Oki. Today, I want to go over a topic that is not near as glamorous as all the beautiful dishes that I can teach y'all to make. Today, we are going to be talking about food handling safety. This past week, I've been racked with just a horrible case of food poisoning. I'm still dealing with the after effects of it, so all this week, I really haven't been cooking nothing that don't come out of a microwave. Because I don't want to keep recontaminating myself, and I don't want to contaminate my wife or anybody else that I love and care about. So today, we're going to go over a few basic things. The very first one is hand washing. You want to use an antibacterial soap, something that's you know, that's actually worth a damn. This is dial soap, it costs like a buck or two bucks or whatever. This stuff is a legit antibacterial soap. You know, you put some on, you scrub real good for 20 seconds. You want to be sure you get up under your nails, you get up in the creases in your palm and in your fingers, on your knuckles. You want to be able to get that foaming action really going. Because it's that foaming action that's going to pick up and destroy all the bacteria and viruses that you're carrying around on your hand. And after that, you want to rinse in hot water. So we've got hand washing down. That's pretty easy. Next thing is cleaning. Okay, you want to have a good clean work area before you even begin. Now, run your dishes through a dishwasher, whatever. You know, use legitimate detergents that'll take care of everything. No problem if you're doing it. In the sink, you know, you want to scrub all the debris off before you really worry about using any soap because that debris buildup is going to prevent cleanliness and it's going to allow bacteria and stuff to surface and a food source. So you want to use, now this is just the, the Home Depot brand soap here, but it's basically Dawn dish soap. Uh, it's an industry standard thing. And you want to use a good grease cutting antibacterial dish soap and you also want to wash that with hot water and you can air dry after that uh, and because Dawn is good you don't have to have a sanitization process afterwards now in the restaurant industry you know we have three compartment sinks so you have your so your rinse like your soap and rinse are two compartments and then you have a sanitizer compartment as well. You don't have to go that route with Dawn, it's just an extra step and that's why we do it in the restaurant industry. It's an extra step that just ensures that we aren't going to get anybody sick. Now what I like to do here at home is I will pre-scrub all my dishes and the vast majority, except for a few pots and pans, the vast majority goes in the dishwasher because that dishwasher has that extra step in it with that high heat that it produces inside for like the drying process. I don't put anything in there that that high heat will mess up. And so anything that will get messed up in the dishwasher, because I've got a few aluminum pots, you don't put aluminum pots in the dishwasher. The dishwasher process will wreck them. And so I do that stuff by hand. But other than that, anything that goes in there, it's gonna have that extra step, and so I love it. Like, like I said, if you don't have a dishwasher, you can get by as long as you have a good, clean, environment for your dishes to dry. Now, surface washing, I like Lysol wipes. I use Lysol sprays, Clorox sprays, paired with clean paper towels. I do not use cloth rags in the kitchen for the simple fact of that cloth is a filter that just picks up all the bacteria, all the dirt, and all that. Now, if you're just using it one time, not as big a deal, but Let's face it, when do we ever just use a cloth rag in the, in the kitchen once? Whereas with a paper towel, you're sort of, sort of forced to. And so I like to use the paper towels paired with a good bleach or other good cleaning spray. I, li I like bleach base because that stuff works. Now, we're going to get into the more, we got the cleaning out of the way, we're going to get into more of the temperature based stuff. Now we have what's called a danger zone for food. And it's something that that's been, that the scientists have come up with through study in bacteria in the ideal growth temperatures of bacteria. That danger zone for temperature is 40 degrees to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and you do not want food to spend time in that danger zone if you can help it. The reason being that in within that uh, zone, especially the warmer end of it, is really where bacteria that'll mess you up, that's where it thrives. Okay? So you want food to stay out of that danger zone as much as possible throughout its lifespan. You can get away with up to about four hours of exposure inside that danger zone, but that's a total amount. So if you've got any time in the beginning of the, the preparation process, and any time in the middle, any time in the end, if you're going to refrigerate it or whatever, save the leftovers. All of that time total can only add up to four hours because you get a cumulative growth of bacteria and virus stuff going on inside your food to where it'll, it'll hit a toxic level for people. And, and these are all based on averages, by the way, but it'll hit that toxic level. So you really want to be conscious about how long your food is either warm or cool, but not outside of that danger zone, okay? So you, you, you uh, got to have a couple of different thermometers set up. You know, if you're cooking, especially outside, it's really hard to regulate heat on a grill without a thermometer, okay? So you want to get a good NSF rated. And I don't know if you can see it in my thermometer here. Let's see. There's a little NSF in the bottom of that, okay, and you'll have that label. I trust anything in the kitchen that says that has that NSF rating. It's just like a UL listing on a light bulb, okay. This stuff has standards to it. It's not just like anything you can buy at the dollar store at Walmart. This stuff is actually backed up by something. So I like to use NSF. I have an, and I have one out on my grill. I've also got one in my fridge, okay. And I just kind of keep it back out of the way. It's not, a, I mean, it just takes up an inch of space, no problem. But you want your refrigeration to be under 40 degrees outside of the danger zone. Well, the only way you can really know what it is, because on a normal refrigerator, it's just got a thing like one to nine or whatever. Well, who the hell knows what that means, right? And so having a thermometer in there tells you what your refrigerator's at. Right now, mine is at 39 degrees. I know that because I can open the door and I look in there and I see the thermometer. Okay, I recommend you guys do that too. In the freezer, it's real easy to tell if stuff's frozen. The closer to zero or below, the better. But anything below freezing, I mean, it'll accomplish the job. Over time, the reason why you want your freezer to be down around that zero mark is so that foods that you're putting in that aren't frozen don't spend a whole lot of time in that transition period in the danger zone. So when it comes to cooking, you've got all these different numbers you can have, and I gotta look at it, my memory is crap. Okay, so I'm gonna pull it up here. And I've got the PDF available on my Patreon for free. All you gotta do is go over to the page, okay, and you can find the FDA uh, PDFs over there. For cooking times and there's also information sheets on everything that I'm talking about here okay and my patreon is just go over to patreon.com slash cooking with Oki or I'm sorry Oki storm chaser patreon slash Oki storm chaser and that's where all my cooking stuff is okay so for your basic like pork chops roasts, steaks all this, you want to hit a minimum temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit after a three minute rest, okay? Now, if you're in an environment where you cannot regulate, you know, your danger zone situation, I like to go up to the maximum temperature on the list, which is what's for poultry, because poultry, out of everything we, we eat, poultry tends to be some of the more bacteria ridden stuff. Okay. And so you want to hit 165, okay? Everything else kind of drops down from there, but if you hit 165 in anything you cook, okay, you will kill, and then again, it has to be for three minutes, 165 for internal temperature, three minutes, and it'll kill just about everything that's gonna hurt you, okay? 
And the way we know 165 is our target, again, is with one of these thermometers. Now you can get a digital version of this as well. Make sure it's NSF rated, okay? These, I like these because you can calibrate them. All you gotta do is get a little wrench, okay? And you put it on the end under here. If you see here, there's a nut under there, okay? So you take this and you put it in a glass of ice water. Ice water is 34 degrees. So I put this in ice water and I twist it with a wrench on that nut until it hits 34 degrees. You know, and that's how I can double check, you know, where my thermometer's at for calibration. I like that because it's idiot proof, okay? These thermometers, just a couple bucks at the store, Amazon, whatever, okay? If you're in a grid down situation and you're cooking food that doesn't reach the internal temperatures that's required here, you're going to get people sick and you're going to kill them, okay? Because you'll get E. coli and salmonella that give you diarrhea, make you throw up, all this stuff that everybody knows what food poisoning is, right? Well, that dehydrates you. In a grid down situation, dehydration is lethal, okay? So you want to make sure of that. So we're going to go over some numbers here. So we've got all the basic meats, you know, beef, pork, uh, lamb, and veal are 145 degrees when, after a three minute rest internal temperature. Okay, and that's for your like steaks and chops and roasts and all that. Okay, ground meat, you want to hit 160. You know, having an uh, extra rare burger is a bad idea. You can get sick from that. Okay, ham, even though it's not actually food, but if you eat it, 145 degrees. And like I said, all of this is at a three minute rest, okay, for all your meats. All right. Poultry, 165, okay? Eggs, eggs are the different thing, okay? You wanna cook the eggs to the point where the yolk is white, where the, where, where the yolk and the whites are firm. Right? A lot of us like, and I'm one of them, I like my eggs, you know, easy, so that the yolk is still running. Well, in a grid down, you either eat that stuff hard boiled or scrambled to where that sucker's cooked all the way through. You know, don't risk it. In modern world, everything's got antibiotics and pasteurization, and this, that, and the other. You're not probably gonna get sick from that. But, you know, grid down, you know, you, you keep eating like you're doing now with eating runny yolks and everything, you're gonna get yourself sick eventually. And then, you're dead. Okay, anything with eggs in it, any casseroles, anything like that, you wanna bring it up to 160, okay? Just like ground beef. Fish, you want to bring up to 145, okay? And then, you know, all your, your, your sea urchins, all that, you want to make sure the flesh is pearly and opaque, okay? So that's your lobsters, your crab, your shrimp, all that. Clams and all that, you want to cook it till the shells open during cooking, okay? And that's for your clams, your oysters, and your mussels. Again, that's not food, but if you eat it anyways, there you go. Same uh, scallops, you want to make sure the flesh is milky white or opaque and firm. Okay, again, that's not food, but if you eat it, you eat it. And then when it comes to doing leftovers, you want to hit that 165 just straight across. No games, no, no playing, none of that. And the way you do that is you check it with this. Okay. And so, that's what I've got there for you. You wanna make sure your freezing stuff, again, your freezer's around that zero mark, that way when you put stuff in there, it gets out of that danger zone as quick as possible. Same thing with your refrigerator, you want it you know, at 40 or below. Okay, now it's, once you hit below 32, it's obviously a freezer, okay? So, when you're cooking though, you wanna heat it up out of that danger zone as fast as possible as well. When it comes to soups and stews and all of that, you gotta boil it. Just straight up, you have to boil it, okay? And if you've got meat and stuff in there, you boil it until it's cooked, okay? You're not looking for, you know, rare, medium rare, all that. You're cooking it through. It's a stew, it's a soup, okay? When you go to reheat it, okay, you gotta bring it up to boiling again. You know, boiling is 200, what, about 212 degrees Fahrenheit? It's well above that 165 but you got all these solids and these liquids and all this surface area, little pockets here and there where bacteria can get into. And so you gotta neutralize it by boiling it. 
It's kind of like saddle, it's taking care of water. You boil it, right? Okay, so that's pretty much what I've got for you today. Again, come over to Patreon. Okay, it's Oki Storm Chaser over at Patreon. And the channel name is Cooking with Oki. Okay, just come on over. You can download these, these couple of PDFs, study them, share them with friends. Because in the end, if the grid goes down, this kind of information will keep you from killing yourselves. All right? That's all I got for you this week. Sorry I can't cook for you. I'm still getting over being sick. And that's, oh, by the way, that's the last thing I want to say. If you're sick, keep your ass out of the kitchen. All right? Now, that's what I got for you today. I'll catch you all on the next one.